Okay, the next method of administration we want to show you is uh, administering medications through a nasogastric tube. This is another way that we're going to be administering oral medications to the horse, usually when we're administering a larger quantity. So I want to start by introducing you to the nasogastric tubes and talking a little bit about the care and nurturing of them. Um, so we have, you know, it's a long tube because it is going from the nasal passage, nasal orifice down to the stomach. A lot of us have our tubes marked in certain places. This gives us an idea of how much tube we actually have introduced in the horse. Tubes come in a variety of sizes and diameters. There's about oh, five or six all together, probably, but these are showing you a variety of the smaller types of tubes. This would be a type of tube that you would be using with a newborn foal, for instance. Uh, and it would go on up to sizes that would be about twice the diameter of, of this tube we have here. We get very possessive of our tubes. Uh, we like them uh, for certain type of consistency that they have. We like the tubes to be kept very clean. Uh, we don't want them to have be damaged. We don't want them to be dropped on the ground, have grit rubbed into them. We don't want this to be rough because this is going to cause irritation to the nasal mucosa. So we like them to be nice and smooth. Uh, that means that they have to be taken care of uh, when they're out of the horse. When we are finished with them, they get cleaned. We'll use a soapy solution. We'll use something like this syringe so that we would flush a soapy solution through them, rinse them well. We like to then hang our tube up somewhere so that it can dry. And then when we store it in our car in the hospital or something, we like to keep it in this position so that we have this coil to it. This coil helps us a lot in when we pass the tube because when we're passing it down we want to be able to pass it in this way and knowing that it's going in the ventral meatus and staying down there. So we just use this type of a case that we keep in the, our tubes in the car so they keep protected and they sort of keep in that coil. So that works out nicely. So, let's get on to Leroy. The final means of administering medication that we're going to demonstrate is passing a nasogastric tube on a horse. So there are a couple different reasons why you might do it. Uh, one of the reasons might be to both diagnose and correct a choke, which is a blockage of the esophagus. Another thing would be when we're dealing with colic cases, uh, we like to pass the stomach tube, see if we have uh, reflux, in other words, an increase of fluid in the stomach that uh, we'd like to get out through the tube, or to administer large amounts of medication, like mineral oil in, a, in the case of a colic, and we'd be giving a gallon, half gallon of, uh, of medicine. Sure, you can't ask them to just swallow a half <laughs> gallon right. of medication. And certainly from the tech's point of view, the vast majority of the time you're going to be in charge of restraint or possibly you're going to be in charge of drawing up medication, that sort of thing. But we're going to demonstrate it as if um, I'm the tech and I'm right. in charge of restraint. Mm -hmm. And that's just so important. Uh, different ways that we do this, and uh, some veterinarians like to pass on the left-hand side here. And this is the way Dr. Forney and I both like to do it. We like to have the tech on our left side, on the horse's left side, and we like to be on the left side. So we're both working here together. We know where each other are. We can stay relatively out of danger, back by the horse's shoulder. Um, but there isn't somebody on the far side of the circle if the horse is circling around us. Sure. Now, the kinds of things that a horse is going to do to uh, evade being tubed, mm -hmm. uh, frequently they'll back up. And so the fact that Leroy's got his rear end towards the corner is, is not an accident. Uh, we put him this way on purpose. And then, uh, of course, they can strike. So you want to position yourself so that you're you know, beside them, not in front of them. And as the tech, you want to position yourself so that you're beside them and you're not pushing the veterinarian directly sure. in front of them. You've got to give them access. space to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, they can rear up. And uh, you know, again, that's being on the side is the best place to be. And then a certain amount of head flinging goes along. 
Yeah, so you always have to be sure that you're not getting so intent on your work, me passing the tube or the tech somehow that you know you, you you start to get your head up close because they are so fast and the head is so hard. Um, so I think that kind of covers. So let me get ready to actually pass the tube. Sure. All right, now we're ready to to pass the, the nasogastric tube in Leroy. Uh, as we said, we're positioning on the left hand side because it gives us a better view of everything. We've decided what size tube we're going to use, as we discussed earlier. Um, your size of your tube needs to be related to the size of the horse and what type of medication you're going to be giving uh, to that horse. Um, this is a Jupiter tube which has a nice consistency to it and in spite of it being a little chilly today, uh, it stays nice and pliable. Sometimes uh, you may want to put your tube into some hot water to get it to a nicer consistency. We like the tubes to have the, the coil to them. Uh, and you'll notice how I'll be passing this as I pass it into his, his uh, nasal passage. We usually put it around our neck just to keep the, it more tidy. And I like to use some lubricant, so uh, some people don't feel that's necessary, particularly with these very s smooth tubes. And this is one reason you want to take care of your tube is to keep it nice and, nice and smooth. And I'm going to also be putting this tube into my mouth because that gives me, a, again, a third hand. Uh, so it will be a little bit uh, difficult for me to talk, so maybe Dr. Forney will help to talk <laughs> sure. on some of this too. But because I'm on the left side, I don't have to pass the tube only in the left nostril. I can reach over and pass it in the right nostril also. So we'll see which way he accepts the best. But so it, just by us being here on the left doesn't limit me too much. Let's see what he does. He's okay, a guy. Little, little big guy. I'm now, guy. of course, again, Leroy was chosen for this not by accident because we think he's probably a pretty nice guy to pass a nasogastric tube on. Dr. Hamill's all the way back into the pharynx, and she's prompting him to swallow a little bit by just by manipulating that tube a little bit and bumping up against his pharynx. And there, I think we got a swallow just mm -hmm. then. Uh, veterinarians have a variety of different ways that they use to tell where they are. Um, it's partly by feel, because the esophagus is a potential space. See, we're still trying to persuade him to swallow with this tube. This is normal, and this we expect as a part of tubing a horse. He's being a really good guy about this. He's standing here. He's not swallowing all that well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the things I can do to help Dr. Hamill is by pulling his pole in a little bit and causing him to flex a little bit at the neck. And sometimes, yep, there we're you go. Now. Mm -hmm. now we're in the esophagus. Sometimes on the left-hand side, you can see the tube passing on the esophagus, and she's watching for that. I just saw it go by. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we joke around about how you could see it, you can hear it, and you can smell it. Because when you get down to the stomach, you can get the gas coming back from their stomach. I'm going to pass on to the, pass on to the stomach now. now. I've just got a little hand hold on his neck, and you can see I'm staying in nice and close, and Dr. Hamill is off center on the front end. Again, that's normal, and you can expect the horses to uh, be a little ticklish in the back of their throat as you're passing that tube on down. Now, I've just popped into the stomach now. I could actually feel the gas come into my mouth, and I can blow on the tube. I can suck on the tube. Uh, but these are all aids that I use to be able to tell me where I am. So usually once we get back past the pharynx area here, they become more comfortable. You can see that Leroy now is, is quite comfortable. He'll... Uh, hopefully, you know, stand here comfortably while we give him medication and so on. I'm going to pass this on to the tech, Dr. Forney, here, and she can stabilize the horse and stabilize the tube also once we know that the horse is going to accept this all right. All right, so we have Leroy here, and you can see he's relatively comfortable with the tube in his, uh, in his nose. Um, talking about some of the medications that we might be giving here. Uh, if I was giving a relatively small amount uh, of medication, like 
for instance, uh, like our old-fashioned worm medicines and so on. A lot of times we would give this by gravity flow, uh, just be able to pour in here and let it run down your tube by gravity. Um, not much, I don't do that much anymore. Do mm -hmm. you? No. Uh, you know, the exception would be when I'm giving colostrum to a newborn born that, There you go. I do that with gravity flow. Good point. Yep. And that's, uh, that would, if you really want to fine tune how that's running in and so on, you would use the, the gravity flow. It's a good mm -hmm. point. If I was going to be doing a large amount, mm -hmm. uh, like I wanted to give some fluid therapy and I wanted to give uh, two gallons of uh, fluid into a stomach, I perhaps would be using something like this stomach pump that will really pour out a, I can get quite a flow going uh, there. Uh, again, that would only be used in special cir circumstances when you'd want to use a high volume. Sure, but like when I um, used to oil a lot of horses that were shipping, mm -hmm. uh, giving them a half gallon of, of mineral oil, I commonly use the stainless steel pump. I mean, that's, that's right, what I so use. so that you can get it in in a hurry. Probably one of the, the things that we use the most when we're dealing with colic cases, and in which case we're kind of using medium amount of, of uh, fluid that we're putting in or oil that we're putting in. But a lot of the time we're trying to see whether or not we get a reflux from the stomach. So this is kind of a little special technique that we'd be doing. So you'd have the, the uh, tech holding the, the tube here. Oh, slid it out a little bit. Okay. And I would be filling that tube up with some fluid. Right, so I'm actually going to press this down into the stomach. And what you're basically going to do is you're establishing a siphon. You're filling your tube up with water and then you're putting it down below the level of the horse's stomach to see if you have an overfull stomach. And then you would siphon out gastric contents, which, and as you can see, coming out of our tube, and this is an absolutely normal horse, mm -hmm. but we're actually siphoning out a little bit of gastric contents on him. Out she comes. Oh, there we go. There mm -hmm. you go, just like that. Now, it can be impressive in a colic that's really sort of at the front end of the GI tract, how much gastric contents you can get out. You know, they can have a buildup of a couple of gallons. That's right, they'd fill that bucket. Right up. And so, but really, technically, all you're doing is establishing a siphon here. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes will play a little bit with that tube, pull it out a little bit, push it in a little bit, try to get that siphon going. There you go. Mm -hmm. Now, Leroy's Good demo. very normal. Right. <laughs> Okay, then for instance, if we were dealing with a colic case, you might then be asked to um, put some mineral oil, put some water in, down in the stomach, which case, again, we would just be using, say filling this with water, putting water, uh, the water down into the stomach through, the, through this. This is our mineral oil and comes in a Containers such as this, it's messy stuff to deal with, but uh, we often will give the colic cases a half gallon, gallon of mineral oil. So there's lots of things that we'd be giving and rather, you know, sizable types of, of volumes that we'd be giving. You notice that with this equipment, one of our safety features that we like to think about is that we want to have the horse and the people <sighs> be positioned such that if we have to exit in a hurry, we can be out the door. Uh, you don't want, again, want to get yourself in a position where the horse is between you and the door. Sure, absolutely. I think we're so, just about ready to take, take this, this tube out, out of <laughs> I can get some of the things out of the way. Leroy thinks it ought to come out. Yeah. Okay, when we do this, usually I'll put a little bit of air down the tube to clear the tube. I may blow on it like this to clear the tube. Again, I want to have good restraint on the head. I'm going to pull the tube out in a smooth type of an action. It's very important to keep the horse restrained at this time so he doesn't fling his head about any more than absolutely necessary so that we get the tube out in a smooth action. One of our problems with tubing horses is that we have a very fragile nasal mucosa here and we can, is, no matter how hard we try to keep our tubes nice and smooth, 
as gentle as we like to be, uh, we can get some trauma there and get some nosebleeds. And this is undesirable, but again, it does happen. Well, nosebleeds are a recognized complication of tubing horses, and if you tube any number of horses, you're, you're going to have one. the occasional nosebleed. And it's not serious. It looks serious. <laughs> There's blood everywhere. And it's very annoying to the horse to feel that blood trickling down his nose, and so he starts blowing it on you, blowing it on the client, blowing <laughs> it on the walls. But nobody ever died from a nosebleed. Yeah. So it's... Uh, People have a tendency to panic, but they really don't have to panic. And the good thing is if you stay unpanicked, it helps the client to stay unpanicked <laughs> on it, too. Leroy was such a good patient, and he didn't really need very much restraint. But I think we need to talk just a little bit more about restraint when you're tubing a horse. Lots of practitioners will routinely twitch every horse that they tube. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that you can do as a tech that will make everybody look better, make it go better, is to be aware of the direction in which you twist the twitch. Because the direction in which you actually take the loop is going to dictate which side of the nose is more open. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and put a twitch okay. on Leroy and we can show this. Or I hope right. we can show this. So right. if I twist it this way, which in this case would be clockwise, I am twisting it away from that left nostril and I'm making his left nostril larger than his right. So I'm giving Dr. Hamill a better target. So that's certainly one of the things you can do with the twitch when you're restraining. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a really fractious horse, lots of practitioners will, will routinely sedate him. It can be a lot safer for both the handler as a practitioner and the horse itself. And you know, our, as we've said before, our sedations are so good nowadays that a lot of people, actually, clients, you know, prefer that. Sure, and there's no sin in sedating them. You know, there's no point in anybody getting hurt. That's right. And then, of course, last, we have to sort of think about what you're going to do with the client while this is going on. Because, mm -hmm. uh, as always, you know, we want the horse to be safe, we'd like to be safe, and we very much would like for the client to be safe, too. Right, and you saw with the technique we used, there were two of us. Uh, sometimes it'd be handy to have three people and so the client wants very much to get involved sometimes and there can be times when we may have the client administer some of the medication because we have to be tied up when actually controlling the horse but we try not to do that mm -hmm. we try to have them standing out of the stall so that we know where everybody is in the stall we're working as a team and nobody gets hurt yeah. just in case the patient starts to explode this brings us to the end